Good morning. Uh, so, so I'm James So. I am a faculty at Stanford, uh, where I work on a lot of, sort of machine learning for computational biology. So really excited to meet all of you. Uh, look forward to talking with all of you this week. So CGSI is like one of my favorite uh, programs. right? Uh, so I've been here for a few years, and it's always excited to come back and meet new people. Um, yeah, so today I want to give sort of like a hybrid tutorial and research, right? talking about sort of spatial omics and how we could think about modeling these kind of spatial omics data with the idea of trying to identify different spatial motifs and microenvironments that can tell us something interesting about different patient diseases. Um, and you know, feel free to interrupt me if you have questions at any point. Um, so many of you know that you know, the, there's been really tremendous advances in sort of single cell analysis, right? especially over the last 10 years or so. Right? Uh, now with single cell RNA-seq, for example, you can look at individual cells and measure many thousands of genes expressed in those cells. Right? Uh, and that's really useful for, for example, for identifying different cell types uh, and different cell states. Right? However, a big limitation of the standard single cell analysis is that in order to get those cells, right, you have to first extract and isolate the cells from the tissues. And in the process of doing that, you actually lose all the information about where the cell is coming from, like who are its neighbors, who is it interacting with. Right? So the situation is sort of analogous to looking at, you know, you have a big puzzle where the pieces are shuffled. Right? So individual pieces of a puzzle correspond to an individual cell, but if you don't know its neighbors and its interactions, it's very hard to get the whole picture. Right? And you lose a lot of important biology. So the goal of spatial omics then is to try to put these pieces of puzzle together Right, so that you can actually see the cells in its original native environment, so you know who its neighbors are and its microenvironment, right? And this provides sort of much more richer information, hopefully around you know, the understanding the biology of the tissue or biology of the disease. Um, so there's been, I think, quite exciting developments, especially in terms of new technologies for spatial omics over the last two, three years, right? Uh, so for example, we have now like spatial proteomics, the example here is shown here on the left, where you can take tissues from patients and then do multiplex imaging for you know, 50 or 100 or more different antibodies in parallel to measure the abundances of 100 different proteins. Right? Uh, in parallel, you also have technologies around sp spatial transcriptomics. So instead of, instead of measuring protein abundances, you can also measure uh, abundances of different genes right? for hundreds or sometimes thousands of genes. So what I want to do first is to maybe give you a little bit of a primer about on the experimental side, right? So how do we actually go about measuring spatial proteomics and spatial transcriptomics? And then most of the presentation will focus on, on the computational method side, how do we actually model this kinds of data to derive useful biological insights? But broadly speaking, uh, there are essentially two uh, main ideas right, people have developed for measuring these kind of spatial data, which is spatial omics either by sequencing or by imaging. Right, so typically with the spatial by sequencing approach, the idea here is that you start with these kind of arrays or chips, like the one shown here. Right, so each dot on that chip actually corresponds to basically a set of probes. And those probes actually have some sort of barcodes or are called spatial barcodes, which encodes the XY location information. Right? And then what you do is that you, when you have a biopsy of a tissue, you basically overlay that tissue, put it on top of the chip, Right? And then each of the probes then will be interacting with the cells right, uh, from that tissue. And when the probes interact with the transcripts from, from those cells, they will basically attach the barcodes somehow to those transcripts. So then afterward, you can basically sequence the RNA, for example, right, using the standard sequencing technologies. But now in addition to knowing the RNA information, you also have this XY location that comes from the spatial barcode. So that's the high level idea. Right, so there's been like a dozen or more of these different specific spatial sequencing technologies. They all basically follow this kind of similar approach. The main difference between these different technologies is in how they actually go about capturing the different probes. Right, so some of them would use beads, others would use like nanoballs, so they have different trade-offs in terms of physical scale and the, resolu and the amount of coverage you can get. Right. Uh, so on the, on the right here, there's some, just some of the more common um, spatial technologies for doing these kind of captures. Probably the most common one that are being widely used is this um, the 10x Visium, right, which is basically capturing things around 50 microns, so on the orders of maybe a dozen or so 20 different cells. 
Right? So it's not quite a single cell resolution, but it has the advantage of capturing a lot more genes. So that's for spatial omics by sequencing. Right? So the complementary approach is to do capture spatial information by imaging. Right? So here the idea is that, you know, that, again, we start with this tissue sample right? we can get from biopsies. And what we want to do is to basically iter iteratively image these tissue samples right, with different combinations of, for example, of antibodies. We're trying to do spatial proteomics. Right? So each of the antibodies will be attached to a different color, like red or green or blue. Right? Um, and then we'll basically image the set of antibodies right, by essentially capturing these different color channels. Now, the challenge here is that because we, the microscopes and human eyes cannot recognize too many different distinct colors in parallel, right? so basically each batch of this imaging is usually only done on a small set of, uh, of colors, a small set of antibodies, so usually like three or four or five. Right? And in order to get many of these different proteomics in parallel, then what people do is basically to image it first with a set of antibodies, wash those antibodies away, and then reapply it to a next set of antibodies right, to do this sequentially. So this is what you see here. You can basically get like a stack of images. Each image corresponds to imaging the tissue, the same tissue, right, using a different set of antibodies. Right? And you can do this many different times. And then in the end, do image processing to put all of these data together into one set of you know, multiplex spatial proteomics. Right? So this is how you can actually get up to you know, 50 to 100 different uh, proteins measurements in parallel. Great, any questions so far? about how these different experiments work? Yeah? Yeah, yeah, so, so, um, so the question is, but what, like, how many markets can we actually do by imaging here? So this technology I'm showing here, it's called Codex, right? Uh, so currently, Codex can get up to about 100 antibodies in parallel. And the nice thing about this is that every, each, for each of these antibodies, you're imaging it at sub-single cell resolutions. So you actually, I'll, I'll show you some examples of this. You actually see sort of subcellular work analysis and morphologies. Yes? Is there any like damage to the tissue when you use these cells to reach that same model? Can you get a better picture of the cells being? Yeah, so the question is, so do we damage the tissue with these washing? So that it, so this is where people have done a lot of the experimental, the protocol optimizations. So there's some damage to the tissues, which is why we can't do this indefinitely. We can't do this like many thousands of times, right? Um, but right, if we do this maybe about 30 or 40 different times, you can actually still get quite high quality images. Okay, great. So all these different methods, right? Uh, but this hopefully gives you a conceptual framework for how people go about capturing spatial data, right? So these different methods basically have different trade-offs, right? So this tr one trade-off is like, what is the physical scale or resolution? Or are we getting things at sub-single cell resolution, which is what codex can get, or at the resolution of maybe a 10 or 20 different cells, which is what you can get with spatial transcriptomics like Lysium. The other one is, other dimension is basically how many genes or proteins can we capture, right? What's the Proteomics methods, right now we can capture mostly around uh, like 50 to 100 different proteins. The transcriptomics can get up to many thousands of, of genes. Okay, so now that we understand sort of the, the, the data collection, right, so more, most of what we're interested in on the computational side is thinking about you know, how can we develop a framework for modeling these kind of very rich spatial data. Right. For example, the kinds of data we're generating now would be like the background here. Right? You can actually get you know, extremely rich data with many different channels corresponding to different proteins. Right? And the idea here is that um, is think about uh, what we want to discuss today is think about how do we model this kind of rich spatial data using particular kinds of graph neural networks, and in particular of using these networks to help us to extract and to identify these relevant microenvironments. Right? So this is what we want to do today on the computational side. OK, so I want to tell you about a particular framework uh, that we recently developed called SpaceGM, which sort of proposes, I think, a pretty flexible way of modeling these different kinds of spatial omics data. Right? And it has a few different steps, which I'll go through. Right? So the idea here is that the you know, first step is that we want to, you know, once you collect these kind of spatial omics data, which can come from spatial proteomics or spatial transcriptomics, the first thing we want to do is to basically turn the raw data into kind of a spatial cellular graph. Right, so I'll just illustrate this with the codex examples, but you can also apply this to other data modalities. 
Right, so we start with like these, uh, you know, these different multiplex immunofluorescence imaging we see here on the left. Right, so the raw data is actually could be very large. You could have maybe tens of thousands of cells in each section. And the first thing that we do is then is to basically segment out the individual cells. Right, uh, and then once we have the individual cells, right, then we can actually create a cellular graph where the nodes of the graph now corresponds to the individual cells, and the edges of the graph will indicate whether two cells are in some sort of physical relationship. Right? If they're, for example, if they're physically touching each other, maybe I can put one type of edge. Right? I can put other types of edges indicating that maybe they're more distant apart. Right? So, then in the, so after we do this, right, then we have this cellular graph, which could be a very large graph. Right? If my image has like 10,000 cells, then this graph would have like 10,000 nodes. Right, so the next step then is we want to, now that we have constructed this spatial cellular graph, now we want to actually do some sort of representation learning. Right, so the goal of representation learning is to basically learn a way to represent the, um, in some sort of embedding to represent the individual cells and also to represent each of the individual microenvironments. Right. So we start off this by very simply, right, so for each of the nodes of the graph, right, for each of the cells, we have some initial set of cellular features. Right, which could be, for example, if I know the cell types, right, so then I can put that as a feature. If I know the expressions of the different genes or the different proteins, I can also add those as features to each of the individual cells. And then there are also kind of interesting features you can add about sort of the cell morphology of the cells, which I'll show you some more examples toward the end. Right, but all of those can basically correspond to a set of initial features, representations of each of the individual cells. So think of them as basically being like a vector that's attached to each of the nodes of this graph. So we're going to model then sort of this neighborhoods, right, of which com comprise of uh, localities of you no know, tens or maybe dozens of different cells, and we model those neighborhoods through essentially sort of message passing, right. Uh, so the cells, which are the nodes of this graph, are right, going to pass messages to each other, and the messages will contain information about like their cellular states, their expression information, right. This each of the individual cells then can aggregate the messages from their neighbors. Right? And by doing these different rounds of message passing, then each of the cells can actually learn information about what are the surrounding cells and what this neighborhood actually look like. Right? This is how we can actually get to this neighborhood embedding. So I'll just actually, since we have a whiteboard here, I'll actually tell you a little bit more uh, detail of how we actually do this kind of message passing. Right? So, So I'm going to draw like a, just like a very toy example of a local environment. Right? I have just four cells here. Let's call this U. Right? So for each of the cells, we actually attach, we saw before, some sort of vectors that captures the cell information. Right? Let's call this H of U. I'm going to put the superscript 0 here just to indicate this is sort of the initial representation of each of the cells. Right. And this can contain information about the cell morphology and the expression levels. Right. Can people see if they're on this side? Okay. Um, and then the neighbors could be like V, right? And then also has like a vector of that's called this H of V of zero. Right. So essentially the message passing for learning these different microenvironments corresponds to a way to um, update these embeddings right, of the individual cells. So here's the rule, right? So now H of V of the center, uh, let's do this H of U, right? The center cell at the L iteration then corresponds to first taking some sort of summation of all of the neighbors. Right, so V are the different neighbors of U. In this case, there are three neighbors. And then for each of the neighbors, I can pass it the previous state of the neighbors. Right. right, from the previous iteration that that's passes this embedding vectors, right, then we normalize this by dividing by the number of neighbors I have for you. Right, and I also pass it on the information from the previous iteration of you, its own cellular states from the previous iteration. Right, so all of this then is, can be uh, multiplied by some update vectors, WL, and then put it through some nonlinear transformations. Right, so this would be like a simple 
version of essentially a graph neural network that allows for message passing around different nodes, right, for learning representations of the individual microenvironments. Right, so basically the key parameters of this graph neural network are, the only parameters are these WLs, right? These are the update matrices. Uh, so essentially like the weights of the network, the neural network, and these WLs can be learned by optimizing for specific prediction tasks. Like for trying to use, learn the embeddings of this graph to predict patient outcomes, then that's how we can actually update and learn the WLs. Yes? Yeah, so great question. The question is like, are these WLs specific to nodes or for the whole graph? Right, so WLs actually does not have any uh, subscripts, right? So, so it's basically the same set of weights that are applied to the entire graph. So you have different Ws for different layers or different Ls. That's right, yes. Yeah, so different layers, right, so you should can have different update matrices. And typically, when we're dealing with kind of spatial omics data, does not have to have too many layers. Usually on the orders of like three to five layers would be sufficient, right? So these are not, doesn't have to be very deep neural networks. Great, yeah. And do we treat all the features the same or do we group them in a way? Because I mean, the cell type is just a single feature, but if you have expression data, you have 10,000 features and so on. Yeah. And that also determines cell type. And is there a mechanism? Yeah, the question is how do we treat the different features? So, so right now the H is just, now, one big vector of all these features, right? Essentially, the different way the features can come through is basically the WLs, right? The W is essentially like a weight matrix that's uh, multiplied to those different features. If it actually thinks that, oh, maybe the specific ex expressions of specific proteins are more important, it can actually put more weights to those subdimensions. Yeah, so the question is basically how do we determine the size, essentially, of the neighborhood, right? So this is basically, uh, it's a good question. So it's essentially like a key hyperparameter, right? So essentially, every time I do the, a round of updates, right, as the L increases from one to two to three, we're collecting more and more information from more distant neighbors, right? If L equal to three, then we're looking at sort of three half neighbors, right? If L equal to one, then it's looking at mo my most adjacent neighbors. Right, so, and one of the things we can do now with this framework is actually ask the model to tell us by itself like what it thinks is the most relevant neighborhood size. And so we'll see that actually for a lot of the cancer samples, it seems like the neighborhood size would be around three half neighbors, around 50 to uh, 40 to 60 cells. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Great, great question. So the question is really around: and Are we basically just capturing a two D slice? So most of the experimental methods I mentioned here for both transcriptomics and proteomics are currently capturing things at two D slice level, right? In order to get the three D information, what people do is then they will basically collect consecutive slices from the biopsy samples and then do the two D imaging, the two D transcriptomics measurements for each of those slices. Right, um, and there are some more newer experimental ways to try to get more three D information, but those are still more very, very much at early stage. So most of the data people are collecting at the two D two D slices. Yeah, so usually these cell types are identified by looking at combinations of multiple marker genes. So, uh, so I guess the model is free flexible. So if we have the cell types, then we can add it as features into these ages. If we don't have the cell types, I can just add in just the raw expression levels. Okay, maybe one more and then we can, yeah. So that's a great question. Um, so in this kinds of models here, we don't explicitly encode the positions. It sort of comes through indirectly because of this message passing through, through different neighbors, right? If my neighbors are a lot of tumor cells, then when I get the messages from these tumor cells, I sort of know that I'm surrounded by tumor cells. 
Okay. So great questions, right? So hopefully this gives you a sense of actually how we then learn the representations, right, of of this large graph. The output of this, right, after you do this different rounds of message passing, then is you have then what we call like an embedding, right? Now the embedding now captures sort of the information from this local micro environment. Uh, and then the idea is that once you have these embeddings, right, so then you can use this information to try to predict, try to look for different spatial motifs. I'll tell you what those are in a bit, and also try to predict patient responses and relevant disease biology. Right. Uh, and in particular, right, once we have the embeddings of different microenvironments, right, so each microenvironment basically corresponds to a subgraph. Right, so a very natural way now to cluster different subgraphs is basically by clustering their different microenvironment embedding vectors. So, so actually how we get these different clusters of microenvironments, each of those clusters then corresponds to an individual spatial motif. And we can use this to predict patient response, for example. Okay, so, so that is sort of the overall pipeline that we developed, so it's pretty flexible. You can apply it to different types of data. So now I just want to give you a specific case study to illustrate how this actually works on real uh, data that we've collected. Right, so to do this, we actually, with our collaborators, collected about 650 samples from head and neck cancer patients, right? So the samples are collected before these patients started their treatment. Um, and the goal here is that uh, for each of these samples, we actually do this CODAX experiment. So we do a multiplex immunofluorescence imaging to capture the spatial proteomics. Again, this is capturing about 40 different markers simultaneously at sub single cell resolution. And our goal here is that we also know the outcomes of these patients after they go on immunotherapies and other treatments. So our goal here is to see, can we actually use this data to identify our other spatial, you know, specific kinds of spatial motifs and signatures that can tell us whether a specific given patient is going to respond well to this cancer treatment. And maybe some other signatures show that other patients are not going to respond well to the treatments. Right, so that's useful because if we can do this before the start of treatment, then can, we can use this to potentially inform what treatment to give to this individual, right? whether we should put them on immunotherapies, for example. OK. So then applying this, uh, this space GM framework on this particular case study, right? Uh, so in this case, right, so the samples we look at are coming from these uh, head and neck cancer biopsies. Um, the histogram on, here on the bottom basically shows that if we are looking at sort of three hop neighborhoods, where you know, L here equal to three, then we're essentially on typically on average capturing about 40 cells, right? But there's certainly a heterogeneity uh, at the distribution, right? And the model actually learns, right, about you know, these three hop neighborhoods around 40 cells is sort of really capturing the relevant biology for these cancer patients. Okay, so by doing through this process that we just did on the board, right, so the, then we actually learned the embeddings, right, from these actual uh, head and neck cancer samples, um, and we can cluster them into the different, uh, different groups, right, so each cluster now corresponds to a specific cup type of these microenvironments represented by these subgraphs. Right? And each cluster indicates a, spe you know, a specific kinds of spatial motif. Right? In this case, in these samples, we actually identified about 20 different types of spatial motifs corresponding to 20 different clusters. Right? So these are shown here on the heat map on the right. right? So each row corresponds to one of the 20 different spatial motifs that we can identify. The columns correspond to the different cell types that we can identify in these samples. Right? So you have different immune cells, tumor cells, et cetera. The, the color here basically indicates within that each of the spatial motif, right, within that kinds of microenvironment, how prevalent are the different types of cells. Right? So the red ones are the more prevalent ones. Now, just to illustrate why these kind of spatial motifs are interesting, right, I'll just zoom in to two of these uh, clusters. Right? So these are the ones that are highlighted in this red box. Right? So if you look at those two rows, those correspond to two different types of spatial cluster or spatial motifs. Now, if I just look at their cell type composition, those two clusters actually have very similar cell type compositions. Right? So the heat map look very similar. In both cases, they have like a lot of these granular sites mixed together with different tumor cells. Right? So for example, if I just do a single cell RNA-seq analysis, the standard analysis, then they would just look very similar because they have very similar cell types. But the nice thing about the spatial data is now we can actually look in and see what is the actual differences in the spatial arrangements across these two different clusters. Right, so the cluster on top here, uh, it has a bunch of these granular sites which are colored brown, and then tumor cells are colored sort of in different shades of blue, and here the granular sites are basically dispersed right, among the tumor cells. 
Whereas in the bottom, we have similar number of granular sites and similar number of tumor cells, but here the granular sites are actually form coherent clusters, like a unified front facing these tumor cells. Right? So the composition of cell types in these two microenvironments are very similar, but the spatial arrangements at this local level are actually very different. Um, and what's interesting here is that the, actually the model learns that actually this coherence of the granular sites, right, when they're facing these tumor cells, is a very strong predictor of how patients respond to different treatments, right? Uh, and the way we can look at this and uh, verify this is to see, okay, if we actually start with a patch here from the actual real patient sample, right, like microenvironment from the real patient, where the granular sites, the brown cells, are more dispersed. So granular sites are basically a type of immune cells. If, um, the details are not so important if, you're, uh, if you don't know these cell types, but it's a type of immune cells. Um, and you can basically, because these are graphs, right, so we can actually very, just in silico, computationally permute this, these kind of immune cells, the granular sites, by pushing them closer together, right, just by swapping the nodes of this graph. Right? So you can do this in silico coherent permutation by putting these granular sites together, and we actually do this, right, so the model actually predicts that these patients tend to have better outcomes. Right, so towards the right here corresponds to better outcomes, which you see after you do this coherent permutation. Uh, conversely, you can also do the other reverse direction in silico, right? Start with a patient sample where these brown cells, the granular sites, are already coherent, and then permute them to make them dispersed in silico, right? And the model also predicts that when you actually do this, right, as the granular size becomes more dispersed, the patient's response also gets worse. Right, so here seems to really suggest that the coherence of granular sites does seem to be a, a predictor of how patients respond to different treatments. Right, so this is sort of one example. Um, basically, what this overall framework looks like is that you know, the, the whole slide can have many hundreds of these different microenvironments. Right, so each of the microenvironments, like the one that we just saw before, sort of makes like a local assessment of how well the patient might respond to treatment. Right? Uh, and then over, in the end, we can just basically aggregate by taking some sort of average across these different votes from different microenvironments to get to like a patient level consensus of how well this patient is going to respond well to treatment. Right, so this is how we can actually go from these individual microenvironment level predictions to the patient level outcome assessment. Questions? Yeah. Yeah, so in this case, we can actually train the network to predict, like, say, patient survival after treatment and also patient recurrence, right? So, how often, how likely is the cancer to come back after treatment? Yeah, so, so for example, here it's sort of detecting like how, how much are the granular sites infiltrating into the into microenvironment, right? So there are other clusters that correspond to how much with different T cells, uh, CD4, CD8 T cells infiltrating into different microenvironments. Yeah, so this is actually trained across all the patients together. So it's about these 600 or so different samples. It's trained across all of these different samples. Yeah. yeah, so that's actually a good segue. So the way that we actually train this model, right, is you know, we collected about these 650 codec samples from head and neck cancer patients, right? And then we actually train the sample, train the whole model over essentially like most of these patient samples, right, which consists of about 1.4 million cells so across different samples. And then we test the model then on other patients, sort of held out patients, right? Um, and going back to one of the earlier questions, right? So the main trade outcomes that are clinically relevant to here to predict would be first like patient survival, how long do they live, recurrence, and also like basically how often would the cancer come back, right? Um, and uh, and we compare the basically the this model that called Space GM that does this microenvironment modeling with a couple of different oblations. Right, so one oblation just corresponds to if I still take the same number of microenvironments, right, but instead of giving it an actual spatial structure within the microenvironment, I just represent each microenvironment by its cell type composition. 
right? So that just says that how important is the actual knowing the spatial information within each microenvironment versus just knowing the cell types there, right? Um, and the I think these are like the AUROCs. Um, then the accuracy of this model by removing the fine-grained microenvironment information, just looking at cell type composition, you can still get some level of predictive power, but you actually see a pretty substantial drop in the performance. Right, so the sort of ablation suggests that knowing the more fine-grained spatial structures within each microenvironment is actually quite important and quite critical. So with a lot of these machine learning models and sort of a, a good um, suggestion in general is that um, often these models, like the big question is basically how well these models really generalize to data from different hospitals. Right? Um, so with our collaborators, they had collected sort of basically entirely independent samples. Uh, so the data was trained on patient samples from Stanford and Pittsburgh. And then they had our collaborator collect additional samples from Dana Farber. So these are certainly different patients who are the samples were actually collected and imaged, which is also used, using some more different protocols. Right? So it's a truly held out external validation set. Uh, and we're actually quite happy to see that these, the model's prediction has trained on samples from Stanford, right? It's able to generalize quite well to entirely different hospitals and patients. Right, so this sort of gives us some confidence that many of these different microenvironments, right, for example, the dispersal of granular sites, right, or infiltration of tumor cells that are captured by model are actually capturing intrinsic biology that are common across different patients. Yeah, question. Okay, yeah, the question is basically what are these, uh, these ablations, right? So as the second row here uh, is essentially we take the same input data, right? But instead of representing each of the microenvironments by this learned embedding from the graph, I just represent this microenvironment by the cell type composition, right? How, what, what fraction of this microenvironment here contains tumor cells, CD4, CD8 T cells, granular cells, et cetera, right? So this is basically gives it the same information minus just the local structure uh, local spatial structure within the microenvironment, and we just ask it, okay, if I take, a, if I take away that fine-grained spatial information, how much worse does the model predict, right? Uh, and does do worse, which suggests that this local spatial information uh, at, you know, at this individual microenvironment level is actually is quite important beyond cell type composition. Yes? Yeah, so, so this, what we describe here, is basically essentially a form of like a graph convolutional neural network. One could also do is say, okay, if I don't represent this as a graph, but just represent it as the original image, the raw image, and just do computer vision convolutional neural network over this image, then can we do just as well? So it turns out that uh, we actually did that experiment, it turns out that it actually does much worse, in particular for generalization. Right? And the, I think our intuition here is that by converting everything into this spatial cellular graph, we're actually removing a lot of the batch effects that come from the imaging, which can differ across different hospitals. Yeah. Yeah, it's a good question. So here, these these particular powers are actually much stronger than what we'd be able to get from just looking at TMB, a tumor mutation burdens for MSI status, right? Uh, especially for head and neck cancer patients. Yeah. So I, I think we're still at the early stages, right, of, of leveraging the spatial data, but we do think that there's actually a lot of information here that's predictive of patient response. Uh, especially by looking at these more granular spatial s motifs and patterns. Right, so just to summarize this whole workflow part here, right? So the idea is basically, you know, we start with this multiplex spatial proteomics data. You can also do this with spatial transcriptomics. Right, we can convert this into the spatial graphs, which actually removes a lot of the technical artifacts and batch effects, and then do this representation learning on top of the spatial graphs to identify the microenvironments, uh, and then generate biological insights by doing these different spatial in silico perturbations or permutations of the microenvironments to see you know, which of these motifs actually predict patient response. So in the remaining couple of minutes, I just want to tell you um, a, a couple of different additional directions that people can take this approach. 
especially with the students here in the audience, I think there's actually a lot of really exciting uh, new ideas uh, that are waiting to be explored with this kind of data because it's still relatively new. Right? Uh, so I think the first direction that I think is, will be really exciting for our research projects would be as you try to incorporate more of subcellular morphologies. Right? Because the nice thing about all these like, multiplex high resolution imaging data is that we actually capture uh, information beyond the level of individual single cells. Right? Just to give you a concrete example of this, right? so here on the left here, I'm showing you a particular kinds of immune cell called a CD8 T cell. Right? It was one of the important warrior cells for killing these tumors. In most of these CD8 T cells, right, if you actually look at this CD8 receptor, right, uh, uh, you know, which is basically how these cells interact with the tumor cells, right, these receptors are basically uniformly distributed around the boundaries of the cell. Right? So the, the, the CD8 receptor is basically colored red, right, and then green is basically DAPI, which is basically measuring the nucleus of the cell. So in the default state, right, these T cells are, the, the CD8 will be sort of uniformly spread out around the boundaries of this entire cell. But in a subset of these CD8 T cells, right, we actually see that these uh, CD8 markers are very much polarized, right? They're localized only in a specific direction in the membrane of the cell. Right? And this polarization, which is something you can actually learn by looking at the subcellular morphology that algorithm can pick up, ends up being really important because it's sort of highly suggestive of these kind of immune synapses which forms when one of these, your immune cells actually interacts with one of your tumor cells, right? They actually form the synapse, sort of like a kiss of death, right? When the immune cell actually kisses the tumor cell at that particular location. Uh, so this is actually what we think is going on with a lot of these polarization events. Right? So that would be an example of like a sub-single cell resolution that will not, not typically captured in the spatial omics data, but is actually present in the data itself. Right. And we can add those kind of subcellular omics right, again into, uh, in this framework as different kinds of morphological features, like in this case, the polarity features. Uh, in some new work, uh, we basically show that by adding these subcellular morphology features, we can actually get further improvements in how well the model can predict patient response. Right. In this particular case, it seems like actually having a larger proportion of these polarized T cells is actually very strongly predictive of, how, of a better response to treatments by the patients. Um, so I think the other direction, it's also very exciting to explore, especially for students, right, is that um, there's, it's still actually quite challenging to experimentally generate a high throughput of a lot of these spatial data, especially spatial proteomics data. Right? I think there's a lot of interesting ideas and interesting works around how do we actually try to essentially generate synthetic data that mimics or it sort of corresponds to in silico spatial proteomics. All right, so here's sort of one example from, from a recent paper that we had for how this might work. Right, so the idea here is that as we saw for the spatial proteomics, you're imaging you know, 50 to 100 different markers. Right? But many of the studies we only have uh, that, that people have done before, they only collect a smaller set of markers, maybe four to seven markers. And what we can do is basically take these four to seven markers that people have previously collected, right, uh, and they also extract the morphology information and see if can we actually use these four or seven markers that are experimentally collected to, to computationally impute right, the remaining markers sort of in silico, sort of generating synthetic data. Um, and this, in some initial experiments, also seems to work pretty well for certain specific kinds of uh, markers we're trying to impute by leveraging the correlations across these different proteins and different stains. Right, so here's an example of the CD163 that's experimentally measured using CODACs, and then the ones that we can actually computationally impute just from a much smaller set of these seven markers. Right, so there's about 30 plus different antibodies now we think we can actually impute computationally which sort of reduces the need to actually have to experimentally measure those. Right? Um, and we also show that if you actually look at, by doing the full CODAX experiment, right, across all of these different antibodies, the cell types you can identify actually, actually match up very well with the cell types we can identify just from the synthetic data, right, from these in silico CODAX experiments. Right? So I think thinking more about how to generate synthetic data that captures different, that integrates different types of spatial proteomics and transcriptomics data is also a good, interesting direction that would be very useful. So just to summarize everything, right? So, um, so hopefully you know, this hybrid tutorial research talk gives you a flavor of the, what are the technologies for measuring spatial omics, both transcriptomics and proteomics. 
And then we want to propose that this kind of graph neural network is a very flexible framework for modeling these kinds of data, right? And for, especially for identifying subgraphs or spatial graph motifs that can predict uh, drug response, treatment response, right? And as a part of a sort of a new direction, right, I think incorporating spatial morphology, especially sub-single cell morphology, is a really interesting new direction because it can reveal additional cellular functions, right, and it can also help us to impute or do in silico generations of spatial omics data. Right, so here are the, the references for the works I mentioned, and I want to especially acknowledge uh, Michael and Eric, who are two fantastic PhD students uh, working with me at Stanford who led uh, these projects. And this is also a collaboration with uh, close collaboration with Enable Medicine, which is a company that's been generating a lot of the spatial proteomics data. Great, so I'll stop here and happy to take more questions.